I'm excited about this because we have very rarely covered the topic of HR and, and legal aspects related to HR. Uh, obviously, we have talked a lot about hiring trainers and, and retaining trainers and that kind of thing. But I think this brings a whole new level of expertise to this domain. You need to train this way. You need to show up at this time. But until we really crafted what our culture was and articulated it, what our story was, the exact job descriptions that we wanted for each role in our place, that's when we really started to see from the aspect of hiring people, we could say, this is what the role is about. Do you meet the criteria? Are you good with it? Yes or no? Until we started to really do that and be able to use that job description as a performance tool going forward, we still had a stable full of people that sort of work together, but not really well. So it's important to put that documentation together, define your culture, because that language and that story feeds through everything that you do, not only with your clients, but with your staff. And until we did all that, then we started, we ran a seven-figure business with a team of 15 mostly full-time trainers who are doing this for a career. That to me is the definition of a successful team. You have to have all those things in place first. Lawrence Snell here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for growing your hit business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. This episode 469, before we dive into today's episode, please grab your free PDF playbook called Referral Machine, Four-Step Referral Blueprint for High-Intensity Training Businesses. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's I-E-F, short for referrals. Uh, you'll also get a full-length video training with Luke Carlson on the best proven practices for driving referrals in your business. So again, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. Um, and yeah, anyway, without any further ado, uh, today's guest is Katie Santos. Katie is the founder of Katie Santos Consulting and Fitness HR, an internationally recognized movement teacher with 40 years in the fitness and wellness industry. Pursuing a human resources certification allowed Katie to focus on helping studios comply with recent employment law changes worldwide. I should really move this over here. Here we go. I can read this better now. Katie's knowledge of the unique nature of the fitness and wellness industry needs related to employees Employees allows her to be their partner and advocate as they navigate the new law changes. Katie is focused on helping businesses and people become their best selves. With the power of Evernote and proven strategies, she encourages business leaders to organize and leverage their big ideas with simple solutions to concentrate on success. So I'm excited about this because we, we have really very rarely covered the topic of HR and, and legal aspects related to HR. Uh, obviously, we have talked a lot about hiring trainers and uh, and retaining trainers and that kind of thing. But I think this, this, this brings a whole new um, level of expertise to this, this domain. So I'm excited to talk to you about this today, Katie. Um, and I think the, the way I wanted to kind of kick this off is hiring is obviously a huge challenge, a huge problem in, uh, in fitness. And, uh, you know, it's a challenging labor market. You know, in our space, I, I, I often hear the challenge around you know, hiring the wrong people, hiring uh, the wrong type, whether that's a contractor versus an employee. Hiring at the wrong time, like when is the right time to hire, and um, for the wrong roles, not having clear job descriptions, that kind of thing, and then losing good people. So all of those things are kind of wrapped up in uh, those kind of hiring problems. And some of that, or most of that, can be somewhat avoided if we really get the, the hiring part right. I mean, obviously, there's a whole other part, which we're going to cover in a separate podcast about retaining trainers, um, but it's key and critical to get that early part correct. So you're here to help us solve some of these problems. Um, so yeah. kind of over, cool. over to you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I started this because we had a fitness business and we felt that we had no control over how people were really training in our studio, even though we could have walked out and said, hey, you need to do X, Y and Z with this client. It wasn't legal to do that where we were in the States. We decided because of that and also because we had a fellow um, studio owner, large studio owner, get audited, they had contractors. They did prevail and prove that they did the right things, but it cost them $60,000 to get through that audit. So rather than to stay awake all night going, hey, I want my people to do what I want them to do in the way I want them to, and I don't want to get hit with a $60,000 bill, Let's just change everybody to employees. And we did that without 
a lot of thought in the aspect of telling them exactly what we wanted them to do. We had an idea, you need to train this way, you need to show up at this time. But until we really crafted what our culture was and articulated it, what our story was, and the exact job descriptions that we wanted for each role in our place, that's when we really started to see from the aspect of hiring people, we could say, this is what the role is about. Do you meet the criteria? Are you good with it? Yes or no? Until we started to really do that and be able to use that job description as a performance tool going forward, we still had a stable full of people that sort of work together, but not really well. So it's important to put that documentation together, define your culture, because that that language and that story feeds through everything that you do, not only with your clients, but with your staff. And until we did all that, then we started, we ran a seven-figure business with a team of 15, mostly, not all, but mostly full-time trainers who were doing this for a career. That to me is the definition of a successful team. You have to have all those things in place first. Mm. Well said. Okay. So let's talk about how we go about doing that so what's the first the first element you've got to get in place again before we start because i because you know try, trying to think about this in terms of where this comes in the journey right if you're like a solo operator training clients obviously there comes a point where you're doing x number of sessions bringing in x number of revenue and you want to grow but you're kind of running out of time and energy to do other things work on the business marketing etc processes uh, and you want to hire a person so what's the first thing we need to think about? Is it, like you say, getting that culture right and what exactly that means? Is that the first step here? Is there something else that comes before that? I, I believe it is. Um, I remember sitting down and crafting a mission statement with my two partners. And it was a painful exercise. And we came out with this statement. To this day, I can't even tell you what it is. It just really didn't mean anything. So... We use um, a framework around work the system, and this is a book written by Sam Carpenter. In it, he talks about defining your objectives and your principles. And to me, when we started to craft them, the objectives were the things that faced out to the client. This is what we will do, what we won't do, what we stand for, how we conduct our business. There's like 20 of them. And oh, wow. each one has a little bit of a story behind it, right? Then we shifted over to principles and the principles were team facing. They covered the gray areas where we knew we didn't want to write some droll policy and procedure. These served some really great purposes. Number one, we could walk by, say my, my business partner and one other trainer were the worst about training a client and leaving stuff everywhere during their session, you know, just bands, balls, all kinds of stuff. So instead of walking by and saying, hey, put the ball over here and the bands over here and the weights over here, we could say, keep it clean and serene, which was one of our principles. I had breakfast a couple of weeks ago with a former staff member um, and I said, hey, staff, do you remember keep it clean and serene? She's like, oh, my God, I think of it all mm -hmm. the time because I still tend to kind of, you know, step out and make too much of a mess. So that's an example of a principle that covers the gray area. And we made them fun. We used them for social media. But better than that, together, they really helped to define the culture way better than a mission statement, core values, et cetera. So I, I think um, having that in place as a living document as you go along, you know, what, what we stood for and what we what we meant to our clients and our staff in 2002 when we opened is different than 2016. So it has to be something that lives. All of those things are something that I used to craft, help craft the accountability chart. We used what I call the aspirational accountability chart. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had all these roles that I would want to hire in my business, but true my face was on a lot of them and then my partner's faces. But there comes a point where you realize, hey, I've got some, some extra money I can hire for this role 
or my bandwidth is getting to the point where I can't handle things anymore. So I've got to step out and hire for this role. If you try to put those things in place when you're on the edge, when you're burned out, when you don't have any more time, you're not going to do a good job of clarifying your culture and clarifying the roles that you need. You're going to hire in a panic. I've done it. Like, I just need a body. I don't care. So it's important to do that. Take the time when it's downtime in your current business or before you start your business to start to articulate these things. When you are at a point where you feel like tasks are dropping that you know you need to do, importantly, I find that bookkeeping is the first thing to get put off to the wayside, right? People decide, I don't have time to do my books. You are doing yourself a huge disservice. So farm it out, even that if you hire a bookkeeper, but take something off your plate so that you can focus on the higher level strategy of the business because it will not continue to grow if you're doing dollar per hour, high intensity training with your clients 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week. We've all been there, right? Well said. Okay. So you got, you, you, you gave some great tips there. Uh, I, I just want to mention in case, just so people are aware, if they want to obviously contact you, they can go to fitnesshr.com, the great domain, fitnesshr.com. Um, so in terms of like the process here, so firstly, work the system sounds like a really good book. So it's, mm -hmm. it sounds like, so it gives you what, 20 odd questions to help you identify these principles, ask you questions, which really help define your brand. It sounds like, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that's hard about EOS is the core value discovery part, I think is one of the hardest parts. It's hard because everyone goes, who well, cares about core values? Like, does it really matter? Jim Collins would tell you it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it's a good predictor. And especially as you bring people on, obviously, because you need to have the sort of common principles that you all believe in and fight for. Um, and yet I find whilst I love the book traction, I do find the core value discovery exercise difficult. So this sounds like a nice uh, tool to help with that. Is yeah. that fair to say? So, um, so I like that. So that'd be the first step, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I've gone through those core value exercises. Um, I was vice president of the Pilates Math Alliance and we had a four day workshop on core values and it was Oh my God. The person who helped us was awesome, but it was the most painful experience of my life. Did no. it work? But no, I mean, oh. in my mind, it didn't. It really didn't sit with me. Mm. But when we discovered these objectives and principles, and to be honest, the, the Work the System book, the whole goal of it is to define these objectives and principles and then start to see your business as a system of procedures, right? I had um, my old boss brought Cold Stone Creamery from like three units up to 300. So I knew I had needed procedures in my business. I called him up and I said, hey, Jim, how do I do this? And he said, well, you take this document with 1.1 and 2.2 and, and you start to go, okay, I'm going to put the key in the door, turn it to the right, write that down. And I was like, Ugh. you know, I'm a movement professional. I can't do that. And I think that's where this work, the system book helps us as movement people because we're, we're, we're business owners. We're a little bit ADD, most of us, I think. So I, it helps us to focus down and not have to go through that, as you say, difficult exercise of trying to establish core values. Mm -hmm. It was really easy for me to flesh these out. I took them once I did them, because it was midway through our tenure, 2010, maybe. I took them to our staff and my two co-owners and I, I got great results from five of them. I, people were like, yes, these work. Another five people were a little bit ambiguous about, and I thought, okay, those need tweaking. And another five people were like, oh, hell no, that's not what we are. So I took them and those principles back to the drawing board and redid them because what I saw was different from our, what our team saw on the ground, day-to-day -day clients. Can I just saw. challenge that for a second? Yes. Could you also spin that and can and and look at that like well maybe those who where it didn't resonate with they weren't a good fit for the org for the organization in some ways and yes I did okay. consider that so it's a good point that you bring up 
But I really wanted somebody that would be willing to come to me and say, you think you're all that in a bag of chips. You need to change the chips <laughs> a little good. bit, you know? Um, but to your point, there was one person that was just adamantly against a lot of them. And fast forward another year, she was no longer with us. So, yeah, but sense. I did like the exchange and I liked having the team involved in it because then they had some skin in the game going forward. Yeah. Yeah, so I, during the review yeah. process, if I'm like, hey, point to this objective, where do you think you're, you're sitting with it? You helped us with it. Are we wrong? Did things change or give me some feedback on it? I wanted to inquire what was going on or are you just right. deciding this isn't the place for you? you know? Interesting. Yeah, that sounds productive. And then, okay, so when we go through that part of it, that's going to really help you start establishing your culture. Um, you then talk about developing the aspirational accountability chart. So again, I don't know if you agree with this, but uh, Traction's a good book for learning how to build this, build the accountability yes. chart, creating all the different seats in your organization. So you need to have a con have this concept sort of set up before you start hiring so you know exactly what you need help with. Because I think a lot of yeah. people might just start hiring people and not really realize, you know, exactly what it is they need. So then yeah. they might end up making, I mean, maybe it's somewhat obvious in personal training in the beginning, you know, need a trainer, but it's a good exercise to do because it helps you. I love the way traction sort of um, compartmentalizes it to say, just think about the, the setup you require for the next six to 12 months. Just, mm -hmm. you know, keep it in that sort of time frame. So is that what we're talking about here, basically? Yeah, I, I take it a little bit a step further, and that's why okay. I call it the operational accountability chart, right? Is if you were thinking about every role in your business, like I, I sit down and I, I want somebody to run my social media for me, or I would dream that I would benefit from a community manager who spent one day a week walking up and down the boulevard and handing out flyers for our next workshop or, or event that we're having. Or someone that reaches out to, um, we did a lot of spinal cord injury rehab in our place. So that community manager stepped out and found resources for those clients that would help offset the cost of training with us because, you know, we didn't take insurance. And so that community manager role was really integral as that certain special population started to grow. We were doing events around them and benefits and things like that. So I like to look out a little bit further. But to your point, your business changes every year, every couple of years. And, you know, you may end up adding a role or deciding, hey, I don't need that role. I put it down there and I don't I don't really need it. But it gives you a chance as a business to look at, OK, I my client load is absolutely jam and full. I'm having to turn people away pretty obvious you need some trainers, right? Conversely, trainers have holes in their schedules that they shouldn't have. So is it a matter of I need to get a salesperson out there or a community manager, or is it just front desk because the phone's not getting answered? So when you can look at what's currently going on in your business from a revenue standpoint, from a, a structure standpoint, like our clients not being served, are they overserved, then you can start to go, okay, this is the role that I need. You know, my, my um, people mm. are asking for classes. I didn't have classes before. I bought some ISOFIT, you know, um, portable things. Let's, let's get somebody that knows ISOFIT in here mm -hmm. to teach small group class with my four portable ISOFITs. So I think it's really important to just keep that there and watch it all the time and, and step back, look at your business, what's happening in here. That sort of brings me on to start talking about job descriptions, right? So once you've got the accountability chart set up or the aspirational accountability chart, and you've got an idea of what roles you want to fill, um, how is the, how do you feel about, well, so, sort of question related to this is, how do you feel about individuals taking on multiple roles? Like you I'm, say, right? If you need someone who's front desk and a personal trainer, for yeah. instance. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because I'm, I'm actually working with a client on site and they are going out on mat leave. They're running the, they're the studio owner and manager, but they're going to pass off some of the roles to someone else for the two months that they're out, right? 
so her question to me was, is it okay if she has two different job descriptions? Yeah. I mean, that's totally fine. She's a trainer. She does groups. She does privates. But now she's stepping more into this studio manager role. Are you going to give her all the parts of it? No. Um, maybe at some point that's going to be a role in and of itself and the owner's going to be out of it altogether for the most part. So starting to bring some of the extra tasks into this role, I think suits that person and that situation right now. An example for us was we had a really great trainer come on board, amazing Pilates teacher. She did all the things. Then we started to notice her social media was really great. And she was very personable and sharp-witted and clever. And we said, hey, do you want to do this community manager role as well as your trainer role? Because she wasn't full-time. And could you take on social media? So she did all three. Full disclosure, because of the social media aspect was something that we could technically outsource to a, a contractor normally. She was an employee for her teacher and her community manager role, but under her business, which was social media, we had her on as a, as a contractor. Totally fine. I checked like a the pseudo role, like to, yeah, to, yeah. 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 But you've got, you, you know, you got to be a little mindful about that too. You could, I could have kept her on as an employee, but I, I wanted to, you know, since she had an existing business already doing that work, it was fine for me to, to put her as a contractor in that role. So sorry, she was, she was still an employee for her, some of her roles, but then a contractor for the social media. Exactly. exactly. And is that, was that, is that going to be different in different states where, how you manage that? It shouldn't be. So okay. in the States, the Department of Labor has recently passed this six test um, for employee versus independent contractor. One of the major ones that we as studio owners never hit is what the teacher is doing or the trainer is doing. Is that an integral part of your business? I.e., I run a Pilates studio. They're teaching Pilates. Integral, right? They can be a contractor if something like social media or bookkeeping or HR is not an integral part of your mm -hmm. business. In other words, you could exist without that happening because you're just going to take it on as an owner. So I could then classify her as a contractor for that role. So on the Department of Labor end and most states ends, that's going to be okay. Interesting. Very cool. Um, I, by the way, I think we're going to run over on our part one, which is fine because I think we need to just keep going. Because uh, we're, we're only on bullet one. Not your fault. Now you're just delivering great stuff. Um, explain to me this community manager role again. I'm not, don't fully understand that. What does that entail, that job you know, description? We, That's interesting. Yeah, it was a really valuable role, and I encourage a lot of my clients to have that role. The job description for that role was someone who they follow up with, not sales calls, but they follow up with groups, especially after workshops or, or um, we did things called Jumpstart, which were four-week series. So they were, mm -hmm. they were in charge of more following up with groups as a community. Everybody who came to TRX class, let's have her reach out to all of them and check in and just see how is TRX going? How is the scheduling? Does the room size work? All those kind of things. She also was um, focused on, as I said, the social media, but in her community role, it was more about the aspect of gathering up all the assets around an event or a workshop or things like that and promoting it all the way down to, like I said, walking down the boulevard and putting up posters when we had events that were related to community. She also took in the numerous requests that we got for, could you do a warm up for the local run? Could you come and, and do a booth at the health fair? All of those sorts of things she handled from soup to nuts to talking with them, making sure that we fully understood what they wanted. They understood what we were, were going to provide and do. We worked a lot with medical facilities. So if they wanted a speaker, she would organize that and find out which one of us owners was going to go and speak to this community. 
as I said, we did spinal cord injury rehab and some neuro work like Parkinson's and MS. So she would reach out to those places and say, hey, we're doing this work. We would love to have your MS patients come. This is the kind of program that we provide. So it was a very broad role and really fruitful. I like to think, um, you know, our teachers, we know our teachers are revenue generating assets, mm -hmm. right? This community manager was really a revenue generating <laughs> asset because they penetrated Absolutely. out beyond I where our that. normal scope was. Looking at it on like a traditional org chart, it's interesting because it, in my mind, tell me if this is right, it would almost sit, if you had sales and marketing operations, it would sit in between that because it, a lot of what you said is marketing, right? Mm -hmm. So a line would be going down to marketing, but there'd be a line going to operations because of the client retention. So it sort of sits yeah. in between. Is that accurate? But, yeah. It, yeah. It, I put sales and marketing definitely, you know, if we think about an EOS focus, mm. sales and marketing, and then, um, you know, our service providers, which are our teachers, the widget makers, right? And as you say, operations. So she's kind of in between, although she did have a liaison with, we were fortunate we had three partners. So my partner, Louise, handled the the actual logistics beyond what this community manager role. But yes, she did kind of pick it both. We did have an outside marketing person that created the overall strategy. So the community manager definitely followed what that marketing person drew up. Okay. Yeah, as, as you were talking, actually, I kind, of, I kind of realized, of course, there are many instances where there are people doing multiple roles. Um, mm -hmm. When you start a business, you're wearing all the hats. <laughs> um, I know, yeah, I know so, a lot of studios where they have, you know, general managers who are training clients. And so it kind of occurred to me that that's very common. And of course, that does work well. It's just understanding the job description. Does that fit the individual's skills and attributes? And I suppose you have to have really good clarity over that job description and what they're responsible for. Uh, I know maybe that's something I'm, I'm jumping ahead to, but I want to get to some of these other, these other bullets as well. Um, so we've, okay, so we've talked about culture there in terms of how you might go about uh, establishing that and having clarity around that using Work the System, Sam Carpenter, EOS, Traction, building mm -hmm. an aspirational accountability chart. Um, you've talked about some of those, some of those roles and how they can be uh, more than, uh, someone can have more than one role potentially. It really depends on what your business requires. Should we move on to just talking about more about the, difference between employees and contractors, why it's important for business owners to be able to distinguish between the two. Is it a good time to go into that? Sure, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, laws change all the time. I'm in California, so we have mega rules and more every day. My, my HR, um, one of my professors said, when your boss comes to you and says, what's the rule about X, Y, and Z? You say, well, it's 804. So it may have changed in the last four minutes. Let me look it up. She said, never go from your own brain about this, you know, the rules. But I'll pause there and put a pin in and, and say that I believe that we really need to professionalize this industry from the aspect of now that COVID is over, people are beginning to understand that health and fitness is an important component in their lives. So they are starting to rely on us as professionals around that. We also have something in the States that we've tried numerous times to pass called the FIT Act, P-H-I-T, mm. which will allow clients to spend their money um, and write it off when they come to have services with us. And I think if, if hopefully that passes, again, that's going to just further legitimize, legitimize our work, right? <clears throat> when I worked for Gold's Gym, I started as a trainer by somebody saying, hey, I know you're training for this bodybuilding competition. Why don't you help me for $5? Great. Okay. Well, I didn't know anything back then. But we do work hard at our professional credentials, most of us. And at bettering ourselves from CECs and workshops and listening to, to you and, you know, becoming better business do that. practitioners, <laughs> right? So I, um, I kind of varied a little bit, but I, I believe because of that, 
we should be able to treat our employees as the professionals that they are and our workers as the professionals that they, as they are. And to have a stable full of independent contractors to me, you're providing a space for them to come in and train their clients. And that's it. That to me is not a business. One of my clients called me the day after the shutdown here in California. And she said, I'm absolutely hooped. All of my people were renters and they're gone. They're teaching their clients online and they're their clients. She had nothing left. She had to close her place. And she could, now I understand, I get it, which was a sad lesson for her and a hard one. So back to what I talked about earlier, you know, when someone does in your business what the integral piece of your business, they're providing the hit services, they're all of the things like that, if you're whatever kind of studio you are, that's the definition of an employee, pretty much. So the Department of Labor here in the States now has passed this federal rule that number one, the opportunity for profit and loss and managerial skill must be present. So if I come in as an independent contractor to you and I help you with HR services, Generally, you're paying ahead of time for those services, but not always. I do bill, you know, monthly for some projects. I have a risk of a loss. So there's definition number one. I meet that. A teacher doesn't have that. They're providing the service. You're paying them. So the second one is the investment by the worker and the potential employer. So I'm investing my time as an independent contractor. You're investing your money right, as a potential employer, but I'm still at risk, so I'm kind of meeting one and two. The question is, are you as a trainer coming in and providing equipment in the form of an investment to that studio? Occasionally, some people bring their reformers in and the studio is using it, so maybe. The third one is the degree of permanence in the relationship. So how many independent contractors are out there that just Stay on the schedule year after year after year. You don't need it. Here's the important one for the nature and degree of control. So if I'm training at a hit studio, there's a certain amount of control that me as an owner, I as an owner, are going to implement on you as a trainer. I want you to train in a certain fashion. So there's control. Number five I already mentioned is that um, is the work integral to the business. That's kind of an easy guess. Then six is skill and initiative. I think this is really the only one that we might meet because we have certain skills as trainers and we take initiative as trainers and we're professionals, I hope. So we meet that criteria. So there's our six. When a government entity comes in to look at you, they look at the totality of circumstances, they call it, which is one of those really vague terms that the government loves. <laughs> and to me, that means I'm looking at all of these. And if I meet one and a half or two, the rest of them you don't meet, you're at risk, right? So in California, we're even more strict. There's only three. And if you don't meet one of them, that's it your people are employees. And I think, um, you know, there's this fear out there that having employees is expensive and it's really onerous and there's lots of rules. Yeah, there are a lot of rules. They're not hard to implement and it is more expensive, but if you sort out your pricing and your pay correctly, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother workshop I have, you know, it can be really easy. And the result for us was a year after doing this, we sat back and went way up. Our revenue went way up. And this is 2007 when things were starting to go down. And I thought there was a certain element of, oh, the universe knows I did the right thing. Whatever. It was because we had a consistent product and we had a staff that understood where the boat was going and they all rolled, rode in the same direction. Clients came to me and said, it doesn't matter if I see Michaela or Stephanie, the product is very similar. I don't have to explain to Stephanie, this is what I did with Michaela, right? They were clients of the studio. So as such, they could go to anybody in there and not have a problem. 
we all have our own personalities. Don't get me wrong as trainers, but the structure of the training was the same across the board. This is a fascinating topic to me. Uh, we're going to have to go over, okay, because it's too interesting. Um, that's, that's, that's what I've, I, I understand. I agree with what you said completely. Uh, and it's this, this idea of an employee type setup is more effective because there's, there's that, that consistency. They're, they're, they're delivering the product exactly how you want it to be delivered. I'm sure there's nuance, right? We're all human sure. beings. What, what's the essence of that, do you think? Why is it that with contractors, I mean, f f maybe this is almost a moot point because it sounds like no one, I mean, where you described it, and I know it differs from state to state, no one's going to be able to operate with contractors for too much longer unless they meet all that criteria, which seems impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe this is moot and we just need employees anyway, which might be a good thing in the long term, as you described. So... Well, in your mind, though, why is it that, if you can maybe elaborate, why having a team of employees who are really maybe invested in a culture and they're delivering consistent experience and product, et cetera, is more effective than contractors? Like, why is it that contractors can't do that? Explain that to me. Um, they could. You mm -hmm. know, I have plenty of studios that I've worked with over the years that have said, well, my contractors all believe in what I do. In my mind, <clears throat> people are getting younger, right? I've, I've been at this for 40 years, so I'm going to age out at some point, right? In full disclosure, I'm not really training anymore. But as those younger people come up behind us, their expectations are a lot higher about what they want to get from where they work. Mm -hmm. They want to understand. They want to know the culture. They want to know that there is a for lack of a better word, mission and a reason for that business to exist that benefits not only the clients, but probably society, right? And they also want to know what's in it for me. The mm. old days of, I remember begging for a job at this fancy new multi-unit gold gym that was going to open up. I was working for another one. I'm like, I want to work for this big one. And they were like, yeah, you're working at the Musclehead gym. Why would you want to come here? Because we're going to be better. And I, I really had to prove myself. These days, the opposite is happening. As so business, interesting. I think you have to prove to that employee, why is it that they should come to work for you? Mm. And because of that, it's not just around the soft stuff, the culture and are we doing good by society, but it's. Are you giving me career development options? Are you providing me with, with education that's going to further my career and make me, allow me to earn more money? Do you have benefits of any kind, health or retirement or whatever else? <clears throat> Am I covered by workers' comp? If a weight drops on my foot as an independent contractor, sorry, you're going to be working with a boot on for the next few months. Am I, if I have to go on disability, my business partner had a stroke right before the pandemic and she wasn't able to recover and come back to work. But because we were all employees, she's now on permanent disability. And are you, for those of us that are approaching my age, are you hoping for social security at some point in your life? If you don't have 40 quarters as a W-2 employee, you're going to be paying a lot more for your Medicare coverage than you would if you were an employee. So not that younger people are necessarily thinking of those things, but they want to be bought into something that they can believe in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think having a pile of contractors who some are floating in, teaching their clients and going away and not doing any of the dirty work of cleaning the studio, and some are doing that dirty work, it sets up, you know, a not good relationship between the team members. If they're that uh, I think that's so true. That's so true what you said. I've experienced some of that and some of the issues with, with contractors. And um, I only know of one business and they're in Canada, which has completely different rules around this, where it's a lot easier, right? Well, to operate right. Yeah. contractors. Um, and they, they, do, they do great from what I understand and they have great relationships and it all works very smoothly, but mm -hmm. I feel like they're the exception to the rule. And it seems to make a lot more sense, especially in the, in the U S 
to have a team of employees for many, many reasons, as you've already uh, very effectively argued. Um, thanks for that, Katie. That's really interesting. So should we move on from this point, do you think, or do you want more to sure. say? Yeah? Sure. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I could talk all day, but as you yeah. see. <laughs> oh, AirPod fell out. That's never happened before. <laughs> That's, usually they're very skilled. Um, okay. Uh, mm, I think we had a uh, question here. How, how do you know what role to fill and when? Have we answered that already? Do you feel? Do you think we could elaborate on that? I bit? think so. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to step back and look at your business as a whole. Where Where are my missing things? Like I had said, I'm full up. I I've got to turn clients away. It's pretty obvious you need a teacher. I am, my front desk is falling to pieces. I'm not returning calls. I'm not getting clients booked in. That's a front desk or a salesperson that you need. Um, I have all these great ideas and I want to do events, but they're not well attended. Maybe you need a community manager. Mm. Actually, I do have one question on this. How yeah. do you feel, I'm sure you've had to address this before, the whole kind of chicken and the egg, egg scenario as it relates to hiring a trainer. Oh, I don't have enough sessions to get the trainer. So I'm going to be like, you know, paying salary for X number of weeks or months. Um, and then I have to try and fill their schedule versus, and where am I going with this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not having that, but then also just like working all the sessions myself and never, ever having any support. Um, it's like, how do you, yeah. How do you reconcile that? I get that question come up quite a lot. Yeah. I set the expectations from the jump. So as I'm interviewing, I'd say the minimum that we want you to teach after 60 days is 10 hours. Full disclosure, when we bring you on board, the training looks like this. That's a couple of weeks. When you move into being on the floor and training clients, it's going to be a slow lift. You're going to start with maybe three or five or six or whatever. So it's going to take some time to fill your schedule. I don't think there's anything that you should be afraid of when you bring someone on board because you can cover it all in an interview. Just be open about it, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily vulnerable. So that's one. Number two is I think there's an element of also focusing your clients on you are a studio client. You may have been training with me for three years, but you are a studio client. I remember um, running a great big club and this, we had this, for lack of a better word, rock star teacher. She was terrible when she went away on vacation. She would say, oh, Ellen's going to be subbing for me. Oh, God. Right? Is yeah. anybody going to come to that class? Heck no. Versus someone else is like, Ellen's going to be subbing for me. You're going to love the change. You know where I'm going with this, right? Mm -hmm. So your trainers have to be on board with understanding that the clients are clients of the studio, not of theirs. And the clients have to be okay with I'm going to be gone for three weeks. I had actually, I had a trainer that went to Ireland for a month. Hmm. I'm going to be gone for three weeks in Ireland. Sally's taking over your sessions. She knows all about what goes on with you, where you are in your programming, how to progress you, all of that stuff. It's going to be great. So that has to be in place. And again, when I interview, you, as the interviewee, you need to understand that people that come in here don't belong to individual trainers. They belong to Absolute Center. And you need to be okay with sharing and passing people back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm just setting the expectation. You could also, I mean, there was an element of me going, okay, I've got a full client load. I can peel these five people off to this new teacher when they're ready. Yeah. And you, new teacher, you're going to take them on. We're going to talk about them. You'll take them over. But you're also going to be in there fostering, getting more people into your schedule. Standing up at the, uh, when I worked in a restaurant, my boss said, if you're not standing up here at the hostess stand with your hand out trying to get menus and a new table, then I'm assuming you're busy and I'm not going to seat you. So I want that teacher to be there knocking on my door going, I've got three spots open. What have you got? What phone calls can I follow up on? I'm like. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because it's the the idea of um, you know, a genius of a thousand helpers building a mm -hmm. business around you, which is a can be a mistake unless that's intentional. Um, versus actually hiring trainers who are better than you, right? So I know yeah. a lot of I know a lot of um hit studio owners who are like celebrities in our space because they're they're well known and they are wonderful trainers and they're 
very knowledgeable about all things exercise and health. Um, and it can be difficult for them to grow a team and move clients off because some of those clients are like, no, I, I, I pay this rate to work with you. And that's difficult. Um, what I found, and obviously you've talked some, somewhat how you can solve some of that. Um, you can also go too far the other way. So what I found, for example, is um, I hired a trainer who, you know, had a, a master's in exercise science. You know, she had a really, she has a really great reputation in Ireland as being probably one of the top trainers. She works with a lot of um, sports teams in her own time. Like she's got a great reputation, very knowledgeable, very evidence-based. And um, she would know a lot more than me about training people, even though I would still argue with her about how we do, you know, how we deliver certain workouts and things. Um, but it was always in a, a good spirit. And uh, what I made the mistake of doing once is I would pair clients with her and I would explain that she's such a wonderful fit for them because maybe they had some kind of like, you know, orthopedic issue or contraindication that her specific skill set would be great for. The problem is, is if then if it didn't work, like if you know, her schedule didn't fit or for whatever reason she couldn't train them, then then that became a problem because it's like actually... I oversold her as being yeah. like the only person who has this skill set in the organization and other trainers can help, which isn't, which isn't true because other people, whilst she might be a best fit, other people could still provide a great service. So mm -hmm. I almost went too far. So I have to be, have to be careful about that, I think, as well. Yeah. And in, it kind of brings to mind what we did every six weeks in our studio was mentor hours. It was free for the people that work for us and we charged for outside trainers to come in. Usually it was one of the three of us owners and it was either around business, which was me. Um, it was around lesson planning, which was my partner, Louise, or it was really around my, my genius, our genius business partner, Claudia, who knew everything. And we would have a focus like Claudia would say, OK, today we're going to focus on um, why is it that neural clients have spasticity? Let's go through that. And I know that's outside the hit training idea, but. Our trainers would come in and go, okay, let me learn about this with her so that I could take on those clients and we could spread the knowledge across so I wouldn't have to oversell anyone. By the same token, you know, Claudia came with an amazing reputation. She was oversold by our clients all the time. So I was kind of the triage person that, you know, when the phone call came, I want to work with Claudia. Hey, let me know some more. Let me, give me some more information. We'd have a conversation about what's going on. It was either a yes, let's have a couple of sessions with Claudia. Then we're going to send you off to someone else. She can just get you through the initial process, write the program. We are busy overseeing everyone else, you know, regardless of the client. So Claudia will always be there as a resource for that teacher. So in that way, I was. 99% of the time I could get those people either completely off Claudia's schedule or just be on their short term and sending them off because it, it is valuable. I think to have that person, as you mentioned, that their skills are just so stellar, they could take on anyone and everything and solve all the problems or most of the problems. But you have to be, as you say, a little mindful of setting the expectations for the clients, right? Mm -hmm. yes. I would also say, to people, you know, you may not get along with them. That's okay. Anybody in here is, you are welcome to see anyone in here. If you clash with someone personality wise, no big deal. We, none of us have egos. We pass clients around. So don't be nervous to say, I don't know if I want to see them anymore. I want to go over there. Yeah. That's okay. No and this harks back to the idea of, well, if you've got good culture, consistent service, you know, you've really established what your business is about you've got clear job descriptions, then the service experience shouldn't differ too much. Of course, everyone's got different personalities and there's nuance sure. to the dealing with working with different humans, but otherwise it should be somewhat, it should be consistent and that's the key. Yeah. And then that's how this is going to be much more smooth. Um, last question for, for you, Katie, and then we'll, we're at, I think what we're going to have to do is actually schedule part two uh, yeah. another time, uh, if that's okay. And I'll, I'll find yeah, yeah. a time that works well for you because it's great. I mean, it's been great though. Um, but the final question I had is, um, you know, we haven't really, I guess, talked about the hiring process. We've talked more about the foundations, which is really important, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you have you have hinted at, obviously, what does it take to um, 
retain a good employees long term, which we're going to cover more in part two. We're going to elaborate yeah. on some of those things in terms of compensation, benefits, et cetera. Um, so let's talk a little bit about just the, how you set up the hiring process um, that results in staff, good staff that stick, right? So what, how do you think about that? What's the hiring process look like? We had a, a website or a web page always that, you know, do you want to join our team? And there were times when we couldn't bring people on and we, again, set the expectation. Thanks for submitting your resume and your application. Right now, we're not looking for people, but we would like to keep, you know, may I keep your information on file? I'm not telling them I'm going to keep it. I'm asking them. Okay. Like um, a wait list. Yeah. 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 So that, that was there. On that web page, we talked about who we were and what we did. We also had little video snippets of our staff and why they liked to work with us. That was super effective. Little 30 second, hey, this is why I like working here. When someone submitted their application to us, they went right into our email funnel and they got a, a confirmation that it was submitted just like a client would when they book a, an appointment, right? So start to think about this hiring process very similarly to how you bring a client on board. Like another, it's another marketing channel just in terms yeah, yeah. of just for, it's exactly, the nurture just process, for trainers. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going well, back to, you know, I used to beg for a job. Now we've got to nurture them into the job. Mm -hmm. We, in that email funnel, we began to set the, um, the hiring process structure up to them. You're going to, you know, when we bring you in, you're going to meet with this person. You get to park here. This is the typical dress. You're going to stay with us this long. We're going to talk about X, Y, and Z. We welcome your questions during this entire process. So then the first interviewer was me. I would have a set of questions. I filled everything out. I did not share that with the next interviewer. So let's say they pass interview number one. Then they go through interview number two. They, she's got her own set of questions. She writes her comments and answers down. And then on to number three. Then we gathered the three of us together and said, okay, this is what I see. Importantly, the three interview process did a lot of things. Number one, we all had a perspective on that person. Number two, if they weren't really fired up about coming to work with us, they probably only came to one, maybe two interviews. Great. I don't have to go any further. You self-selected out the door. Yeah. But we got a very clear picture of who that person was. We were careful not to share information ahead of time before someone else interviewed because I just didn't want that bias showing up, right? If somebody had said to me, yeah, I liked her, but boy, she came in with whatever. Okay. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to form my own opinion. So let's say then someone comes on board, they get a formal offer, offer letter with a deadline to respond. It outlines the job description or attached the job description, the role, the salary, the expected start date, the training, Cadence, you know, you're going to be training for the next 60 hours till this date, the schedule, um, and then who to report to, what the, what the day is going to look like. You must respond by, and I usually gave them three days, depending on if it was. And it was for free interviews. Yeah. And over what time period were those interviews held? Um, it was kind of where we could fit it in, to be honest with you. They didn't last more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. So often we were working around their schedule and our schedule, but, um, so you've got the, you, sorry to interject. You've got the, obviously the, 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 um, high, slow, fire, fast idea. Um, I have I heard actually, some people say higher, I'm fast. Stop you. So I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, I say yeah. higher, fast, fire, slow, Oh, because if you have everything in place, you know, exactly what kind of person and skills that you need when you see it. You can hire them fast. Yes, there's three interviews, but I can't sit and dawdle around. If I spot someone, you know, I'm going to hire them quickly. Do you not I'm think you need some, it's easy to make the mistake of hiring fast, right? Like, uh, oh, you see what you like emotionally, or maybe even objectively for your questions, mm -hmm. but there's still a lack of rigor in that maybe. I mean, for instance... I know another organization who we both know, who I won't name, <laughs> uh, who have a process where they'll do 
you know, they'll have them submit actually like a video first yes. of them, like yeah. talking about the core values and how they resonate with them. Uh, then they'll do the a group interview where it's not even an interview. It's like, it's like the, it's like the, um, you know, the movie Boiler Room, you know, the scene where yeah. Ben Affleck walks in and says, this is what we're about. This is who we are. If you don't want to get rich, leave, you know, yeah. like there's, there's no, there's no judgment. And then the next stage is the who interview, which just sounds like what you guys do, where you're mm -hmm. asking a ton of very, very refined, effective questions to really learn who people are. And then I think after that, you've got the, the who interview is a group. Again, it's multiple uh, individuals from the business interviewing that candidate. And then mm -hmm. there's a bit after that that does the whole traction. Is it right person, right seat, wrong person, et cetera, to, 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 to figure out whether or not they're a the right fit, which can still be done if mm -hmm. super organized in a relatively short time frame, I, I suppose. Yeah. How do yeah. you feel about that? Sorry, I know I just had to give you that for context, but I'm really curious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I, I what I notice in a lot of places is we can't, unless you're large, there's you can't gather up enough people to get a group interview, in my opinion. Okay. I, I've not seen it work effectively it's, for this. I suspect it's much harder now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. Um, especially when you get one resume every six months. Um, so the group interview to me is kind of off the table. When I say fast, I'm thinking, you know, I went to work for an airline and it took four months to get through the interview process. That's not fast. Okay. You know? So two weeks to me is quick. We're going to get together, the three of us, and hash out where this candidate lies. Can we bring them on board? And I send them an uh, offer letter right away. So in that way, it's quick. They do do an audition with us, but we do have to be mindful. I know there's places where they, they have you come in and train a client. Mm, or... Sorry, that's one of the steps I missed, actually, the workout audition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's the third one. Um, they they have you come in and, and conduct a, a workout session or do a workout session. That's a little bit fraught from a rule perspective, in my mind. It's a little tricky. What if they got injured and oh. they're in an interview? You know, that could be not pretty. What if they injure a client that they're auditioning on, you know? Um, so I, I kind of shy away from that a little bit myself. But when I say fire is slow, I believe You've done the work to bring them on board, to train them properly through the training process, however long that looks, depending on the level of their expertise. If something goes wrong, I believe that it's time for you to start to look at yourself as an owner and go, where did I drop the ball? Was it a training problem? Were they not brought into the culture correctly? Was there something that happened with a fellow team member or a client that might cause them to disengage? Or is it them? But it takes me time to suss that out. And if it's a training issue, lather, rinse, repeat, go back and fix it as an owner. So I'm not ready to, unless it's a really egregious um, mm. breach of your protocol of some sort, you know, theft or drugs or whatever, then yeah, that's a, a fire fast thing. But I understand, um, you know, people say fire fast because you don't want the person to create a toxicity in your workplace. If you're seeing that, that's a different story. That's about them. But if you're seeing something else, I believe take the time, find out what, what's going wrong, what's happening with that particular um, trainer. I'll tell a tiny short story. I had a trainer that we brought on board and she was just so all over everything. She would show up for community events and work extra time and all the things and take on clients. And, and then she started to disengage and we decided to have a conversation with her. And she said, you know, I was a massage therapist. And while I like teaching small groups, one-on-one -on -one training isn't for me anymore. It's like too much energy and talking. So we said, what if we could figure out a way for you to, to do massage here? She said, that would be great. So long story short, we found a spot for her in the studio to do this, which was semi-private. We had to change things a little bit. And she just went completely off the one-on-one -on -one schedule. She lit up. She's like, I could see the things that were happening with my one-on-one -on -one clients that I knew I could solve with massage. So win-win for everybody. She was back on board. 
But just having that conversation, otherwise I would have said, oh, she's disengaged. Let's get her out of here. You know? Yeah, interesting. So it's, okay, again, having a good performance management process, right? Which is, is that right in terms of like, that might take some time to do that effectively. And that's where the higher slow, yeah. sorry, fire slow comes from because you're trying to identify the problem is who right. owns that problem. But then to your point, if you just work out quite quickly that they're just not a core value fit, which is really fundamental, then mm -hmm. they might self-remove yeah. quickly anyway. And then it's still time to look at yourself as the owner and go, okay, right. they weren't a fit. What did I miss? Where right. did I go wrong in yeah. the interview process? Because it would have been there somewhere, I believe. And just one other question about the interview process. What... Uh, do you have any um, things you can share in terms of like frameworks you would use for those interviews? Is it like the who interview? Like, is it inspired by that model or is there, um, is there other resources? We for wanted that? to, in my first interview, I wanted to make sure that as far as the structure of the job description and the requirements of what we needed were clear. So we were hiring a weekend trainer. Are you available Saturdays and Sundays? Or are you available evenings? If you're not, I'll keep your stuff on file if and when you are, or we have another opening that suits your schedule. Great. Would you not want to pre-qualify that out in the, on the landing page? You so know, you don't even have to go my, to interview my one. My experience <laughs> was that they would submit anyway. Oh, <laughs> you know? right, right. I'm so awesome. They're going to let me train whenever I want, right? Okay. And maybe that's true, but if I don't need that right now, you know, if I, I did have some flexibility, then yes, I know that our requirements right now were Saturday and Sunday, but, you know, based on what you've shown me, there's a possibility of moving things around. Or if in my business at that point, that wasn't possible, I had to stay hard and fast of we need Saturday and Sunday and nothing else, you know, that's, yeah. that's as far as we go. The second interview was more around what you know as a professional. How would you handle this client situation? How would you handle a client with MS? Or have you ever worked with orthopedic injuries? Or what's your favorite type of client? All of those kind of focuses. The third interview was the audition. You know, we would set them up with, here's a client. I want you to just step right, depending on their experience. If they were experienced, Step into the client and do the things that you would do on a first appointment. I want to see you asking about them, what their goals are, what their issues are, you know, how often they're available, that sort of thing. And would then, you also role play that with trainers yes. as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they do the audition. I'm looking for their ability, not only their skills that they, they come with, but are they able to package those skills into a deliverable that makes the client engaged? Mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Um, after we're done with that, usually it's a coaching session for us. We can't get away from being teacher trainers. So we'll say we saw this. Here is how we would have done it. What's your perspective on that? You know, mm -hmm. and if they go, oh, I, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think what you're doing is what I would do. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a flag right there, right? That's a good one. I want somebody that's able to be taught and able to, one of our principles was don't get fooled again. Meaning if you messed up, cop to it. We'll talk about it and we move on. Yeah. Mm, got it. Shall we, um, I was just thinking like one thing we haven't really touched on, which is I'm, I'm sure very interesting subject to people is effective recruitment tactics, right? And I mean, you mentioned the website is the, the foundation yeah. of that. Do you want to talk about that or should we share that for another time for maybe we another book? We could do it another time or we can talk about it right now. I'm, you know. Give me the top three. Yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I hear a lot. They, people are like, I post on Indeed. I can't get anybody. Mm -hmm. I think the first place to look is on social media. So many people went off into their own little garages to train over COVID times. When I go to conferences now, I hear from every teacher I talk to, I'm so tired of training by myself. I want camaraderie. I want to be able to mm -hmm. look at another trainer and go, that's cool. How so come lonely. Doing that? mm -hmm. You know, so that's missing in our, in our organization when there's people out there working on their own. So stalking social media, diversity job boards, I feel are really important, especially when you're looking for administrative positions. One of the best hires we ever made was a young man on the spectrum. And we were just talking about him the other day. 
he was so diligent and so focused on his role and so well his parents had really helped him to navigate the social interaction piece so while it was very route when he to everybody hi i'm michael welcome to absolute center all the time it still was welcoming right and he he was just such a great employee and willing to learn we also hired people that were um had disabilities you know in wheelchairs people who had sight issues when we think about a typical trainer job description it says must lift 50 pounds do they really have to or can we get a client to do that for us right mm -hmm. yeah. so i think you're leaving out a population of potential really good teachers if you're not looking at a um, diversity and disablement community so those are kind of the the top areas i would look that first one when you talk about social media that's a really good idea actually um, it's not simply an idea. How do you exactly do that tactically? So, you know, do, are, you, are you looking for specific profiles? Are you then DMing those people? And mm -hmm. you want some kind of really good DM, right? That's like, yeah. hey, uh, I don't know. Do you feel lonely training people yourself? Would you like to be part of a team? And then well, it's go also into a, a pitch, picture. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got to start with a compliment to them. I've been watching you yep. for X amount of time and using your work in this situation. Valerie is always good. Yeah. We have this going on and you'd be an amazing fit. I see that you're local. Is this something you might be interested in coming on board a couple, three days a week with us? You know, and if you are, please reach out. Even if not, I welcome you into the studio. Come and do a workout. Be my guest. You know, maybe they'll show up. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how would you go about finding those social profiles? Do you just explore and, and try and find fitness yeah know, like fitness people yeah go ahead so one of them um there's a couple of search engines this sounds really odd but there's a couple of search engines around podcasts mm -hmm. and in those podcast search engines you can go in and say okay i'm gonna pull out tanya poppet who i follow yeah, has she been on a podcast where if so which ones and what has she had to say you know so i can delve in a little bit more about about her um, then I can see what the hashtags is that are that they use around her and then carry those into, um, the social profiles. Got it. Do you know, I just had an idea. You could find fitness influences that, um, that are congruent with your brand, right? Yes. You, you, you don't necessarily want to uh, approach someone who is following a fitness influencer who you hate and is really <laughs> not congruent with your brand at all right so you yeah. find that fitness influencer that's like you know somewhat congruent with your brand that's not too perfect and then you look at all the people that follow them or a sample that follow them and then you look at all their profiles and you'll be able to identify those who are doing online training from home or they're just personal trainers operating out of maybe their own space or a commercial space or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and go that way. That's really, yeah, I think that could work quite well. Yeah. Um, yeah. One idea I had that worked really well for us um, when I was working with Optimus Strength, which is a local studio here in Galway, I'm no longer involved, um, but uh, this worked really well, is we, what we did, and I, I, I completely should give credit to uh, Luke and Discover Strength for this. If you are, again, it's really, no, this could work for regardless of what type of trainer you want, but we wanted trainers that were going to have a degree in exercise science um, right. and be able to deliver an evidence-based approach training. And so what we did is we we started trying to build relationships with a lot of the faculty in a lot yeah. of the local colleges, universities. Mm -hmm. um, and we would say, I would I would build that relationship and I've, I've, I've you know, build these sort of template emails and then tailor them to kind of say, do you have, you know, is this coming up for graduation? Do you have anyone in mind who yeah. um, would be interested in an opportunity? Again, making the opportunity, obviously, warts and all. Like, this is what it is. These are the hours. Like, mm -hmm. it's not just, hey, look how great this is. It's like, this is, this is the honest view. But obviously, you make it attractive. And then not only graduates who are just about to graduate, but also alumni as well. Yeah, and yeah. that then triggers a whole nother. Oh, yeah, I know loads of alumni people to be. This is a great opportunity, and you know, we had a really attractive have I should say because the business is still operating um, a really attractive compensation plan that just blows every mm -hmm. other studio out of the water. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. And so anyway, that worked really well for us in terms of, you know, we recruited a couple of really high level trainers doing that who you know, still uh, working with us today and it's uh, it's worked very well. So that's another one, which I credit Discover Strength for, but that's worked very mm -hmm. well. And again, I guess, so I know I'm going off on one now, but I guess um, that can work. It doesn't, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be that your studio does, you know, we have to have a degree in exercise science or deliver evidence-based training. If you have a lower bar, then you can talk to colleges and universities yeah. that are, um, you know, shall we say kind of lower, lower ranking, you know, and yeah. that's, yeah. you'll find those types of people. So that's another avenue, I guess. No, we yeah. definitely, we had a local college near us um, and we would go after their exercise science people all the time, okay. you know, even if it wasn't like an internship and paid, mind you, but an internship. Um, the other thing is following the equipment manufacturers like Torque and things like that. Who's following them, right? Okay, yeah. And yeah. equipment. So that's an interesting at, one. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were fortunate in the Pilates world because we could reach out to equipment manufacturers and say, hey, who's the local teachers around here that are buying your equipment? Mm -hmm. And we would find them as a resource. They were also education providers as well. But, you know, there's a lot of body weight training folks like Animal Flow and, and whoever follows Animal Flow or is, is trained in Animal Flow, maybe they're willing to get on some equipment these days and start training, you know? Mm. So there's I, don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a wizard uh, when it comes to Instagram, to be honest. And I wonder Me how neither. you can, you can find <laughs> who wants to be right, but you can, uh, it's evolving all the time. Yeah. But you probably somewhat localize those searches to make sure there's people that appear yes, you are, can. You are can, local. Yeah. If, if you're trying to grow a physical studio business, then that's going to be obviously pretty important. Um, Katie, this has been amazing. Like, genuinely, this has been such a, an amazing podcast. I hope, and I, I Strongly believe my audience will find this really valuable. I hope so too. No, it's been fun. I know we kind of went over there, Lawrence. It's, this this happens all the time. I do this a lot. I'm like, hey, we're going to do part one, part two. We're going to record both back to back. No, we're not. <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence is going to talk too much, ask too many questions, and we're just going to do one. And that's fine. Uh, there you go. Um, so, uh, you know, before we kind of wrap up, um, is there anything else you want to share? I know like you're really passionate about, you know, creating this awareness around you know, potentially these potential lawsuits that might happen because we're not adhering to um, these these HR legalities. Studios are getting audited. Do you want to maybe touch on that uh, just to make everyone aware? And then yeah. please let me know how people can uh, contact you and get in touch. Yeah. So first off, it's not scary to have a team of employees. And like I said at the start, it does take some extra work and it's some extra money, but you can position yourself so that it's not as painful as you might imagine. There are entities coming out there. I have a, a client going through one now. She's got a work comp audit happening. She has kind of a mixture of, of people, independent and employees, and she's getting hit hard, several thousand dollars. I have someone else that got audited and she had everyone else's employees except for the one 92-year-old yoga teacher that would come in one time a year. And she got hit with that. Wow. So those are kind of, best case. There's some other judgments out there um, called private attorneys general's claims, which can run into the millions if something goes wrong. And that's not something that those kind of judgments are not things that you can discharge in bankruptcy. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so if I haven't scared you enough, it is not hard. It it creates so much more ease in your life. You're going to be able to go out on vacation instead of working seven days a week. You also are building a business that is saleable in the end or franchisable if you want. When you have the whole structure of the business ready to go, whether it's I want to sell it and go live in, in Florida for the rest of my life, or if you want to start to duplicate or open another studio or to franchise or license, you have to have all this sort of structure in place from the accountability chart to the job descriptions that go along with it, to the hiring process, to the procedures and policies that go on in your studio so that your, your people, one of our, our objectives was we run our business on proven written policies and procedures. So when a staff person came to, to oh gosh, I've got to sub, find a sub or I've got to go on vacation, they would start to walk into our office to say, how do I do that? They knew we ran on written policies and procedures. So they were like, eh, I bet there's a policy for that. Let me go look in the book, right? So that saved them and us time and money. 
If you want to talk about this further, I'm happy to book any of your listeners into a 25-minute complimentary consultation. We're going to talk about what's, what's best for you as a studio. I work with studios in the UK. I know you guys have different rules and, and focuses there, but it still doesn't mean that we, we can't talk about nurturing your, your studio team members into being the best they can be for your studio. If you're in the U.S., I can help you through <laughs> navigating all the things. There's also a research a resource on there called the um, 10, 10, 10 Tips to Bringing on Your Best Team. So you can download that, get on my email list. And that's about it. Till next time. I know we've got lots Perfect. more to talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, but they, they, thank you for, you know, uh, referring both to, to, to the U.K. and the U.S., but the vast majority of listeners are, are in the U.S., um, yeah, and that's uh, fitnesshr.com. It's a place to go to get access yes, to all of that you just said. That's great. And uh, Fitness thank- HR on Instagram. I, I'm, I'm not, okay. like, as you say, not Instagram. I'm savvy enough, but I haven't been on there lately. But I'm going to start posting some more tips. Yeah. So. Oh, don't, don't do what I did and delete your Instagram account because you get all high and mighty about it. You don't need social media. And then you change your mind, start again, and have like 300 followers. So I had like, a, I don't know, over a thousand. And, and uh, oh, no. I don't know if many people, I don't know if many people know that actually. Um, and I also got banned from Facebook and I have no idea why. So what's funny is my oh, personal profile yes. got removed, but cool. I still have the business profile, but I can't access it. But my, I've got a guy that works with me who helps me manage that and he can access it. It's all very weird. So I'm uh, uh, I understand the value of social media, but I'm always telling people, get people on your own email list, build assets yeah. you control, utilize yeah. social media, but you've got to realize that you have really no control over these platforms or algorithms. You know, they that's can right. hack your accounts, can get hacked, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's what happened with us. Anyway, that's completely unrelated to the topic of today. Um, <laughs> so Katie, thank you so much. It's been amazing. And for everyone listening, to get the show notes for this episode, as always, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. I need a better domain like fitnesshr.com. That's that's shorter. Uh, And search for episode 469. And until next time, thank you so much for listening. Hey, it's Lawrence again. Before you go, I have something special for those looking to accelerate their hit business. Would you like to know how to generate a flood of leads for free? Download our exclusive Builder Referral Machine Playbook. It's a concise guide packed with proven strategies from Luke Carlson, CEO of Discover Strength, a fast-growing hit franchise. Clients in our hit business membership using these referral tactics have added 20 to 40 new clients, transforming their businesses dramatically. In this playbook, you'll uncover four dynamic referral tactics that you can implement right now to drive leads. Plus, when you download the guide, you'll gain access to invaluable resources to expand your business, like ready-to-use sales presentations, a guide for attracting top-notch trainers, a checklist for nailing your sales process, and so much more. And there's a bonus. Subscribe today to ensure you don't miss out on exclusive opportunities like live group calls of hit experts. Plus, you have the chance to contribute questions for our interactive Q&A blog posts and podcasts, where we directly address your queries with industry experts. These special events are scheduled periodically, and as a subscriber, you'll be the first to know when they happen. Just visit highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F, short for referrals, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, or click the link available where you're watching or listening to this, drop in your email, and you'll get instant access to all these resources today. 